Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for part two of putting the DEC recommended practices to work in parent centers. I'm joined today by um, family ambassadors from four uh, parent centers across the country, whom you'll meet in just a little bit. My name is Stephanie Moss. I am with Parent to Parent of Georgia, the Region BP Tech, and the Urban Childhood TA Center. Um, and we're glad to have you join us today. Just a quick recap. Um, you may know or you may not know that this is part two of a webinar series on the recommended practices. Part one has already been recorded and is already available to you from the SIPR site. And during part one, we helped participants become familiar with the DEC recommended practices. And with a suite of resources that was developed by the Early Childhood TA Center, those resources can be used to support families in using the recommended practices. And we helped participants learn how to access those resources to support the families that they're working with and parents across the country. So today, what we're excited to be able to share with you is the voices of four family ambassadors who are going to tell you very practical ways that they have already begun using and sharing the recommended practices as part of their work in their parent centers. And hopefully, we're going to give you some ideas and some suggestions of ways to use the recommended practices in your daily work with families when you hear from how they are using the practices today. So you might go, well, what is that? You might still be sitting here thinking, what does that look like? Well, how would I use these recommended practices? And this little word cloud right here just gives you some ideas and some of the suggestions we've heard from ambassadors across the country, um, training families, website content, social media, um, using them on a local, regional and national level, newsletter articles, just in staff training and in family training, things like that. There are so many more ideas than you see here, but this is just a flavor of what you're gonna hear a little bit more about today. So without further ado, I'm going to move the slides along and let you start hearing from some of the ambassadors. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Adriana Fontaine. I'm a bilingual parent consultant and early childhood support programs manager at the Connecticut Parent Advocacy Center. And I have been the RP ambassador to Connecticut for over a year. Um, I'm going to share with you some of the activities that we are doing at CPAC to incorporate the recommended practices. Parent centers are a great resource for families. We educate, support, and empower families of children with developmental delays and the professionals who serve them. We know that empowerment and advocacy need to start early on from the moment parents learn their child has a developmental delay. And by disseminating the recommended practices, we are providing them with the tools to promote their child's development and enhance their engagement with providers. We have successfully integrated the recommended practices in our early childhood support programs, trainings, and technical assistance calls. Parent consultants can use the recommended practices to guide their narrative and for snippets of reliable information on child development and tips to help pa uh, parents communicate their priorities to professionals. Parent consultants can rely on this info during the support they offer to families in their daily technical assistance calls. One example comes to mind when I supported a parent who was not sure if sharing information about her child's behavior, frequent tantrums to the team was necessary as she thought it, that it was a discipline issue on her side. For this technical assistance call, I used the family member roles in informed clinical reasoning to illustrate to her the importance of sharing unusual behaviors behavioral challenges across setting and frequency. We developed a list of concerns for the team and the team was very receptive. As a result, they decided to do further assessment. The recommended practices can reach diverse segments of targeted audiences. They're available in Spanish and monolingual families connect with them in a positive manner. In our next steps training, we included naturally occurring child learning recommended practice and child learning comes naturally recommended practice guides in Spanish to illustrate the concept of natural learning practices in early intervention. The recommended practices were very helpful in explaining to parents how our state's early intervention system works and its main practices. Families remain engaged with the videos and songs in their own language. Even though 55% of parents did not know about the recommended practices or where to find them, 82% strongly agree that they were the most helpful part of the videos. Equally important is our commitment to ensure meaningful and equitable access to our services, programs, and activities in the family spoken language. This includes our monolingual families enrolled in the Preschool Pathfinder program. This program was developed in partnership with our State Department of Education with the purpose of providing one-to-one -one support to families facing challenges 
during their transition from Part C to Part B. Through the program, we review records, attend IEP meetings, and have coaching sessions with the families. This process is parent-driven. And if a parent has informational gaps regarding transition, we use the Spanish recommended, recommended practices for transition. For monolingual families, transition can be extremely overwhelming. There's a lot of technical jargon. The concept of inclusion and procedures might not be clear. Special education sometimes is an isolated placement rather than a program in their countries. And sometimes they feel inclined to reject services due to these factors. We avidly employ the families family practice guide, your child moves from early intervention to preschool special education in our coaching sessions. This guide promotes parent participation in the transition process. It provides tangible questions that parents can ask school staff and guide their thoughts at IEP meetings. We usually go over this guide with parents via Zoom or over the phone and help them formulate questions such as, how will the school decide if my child is eligible? What kind of testing will be needed? And who can I call if I have questions? The second guide that we use in our coaching session with families is the transition from early intervention to preschool special education, available in the practitioner guide section. Families can see what needs to be happening before their child turns three, their provider's responsibilities in ensuring a smooth transition and their rights as parents. It also covers the importance of ongoing communication during this challenging time. Finally, our Family Connections program, developed in partnership with Connecticut's Birth to Three system, aims to provide emotional support, guidance, and resources via parent mentors, technical assistance, and trainings. In our Tier 1, we have universal supports. It's a more interactive approach, and it's available to all the families enrolled in the program. Families can sign up for our bi-monthly newsletter. We have a section dedicated only to the recommended practices and the Early Childhood Technical Assistance Center. We also have a Facebook support group. We create monthly posts regarding the development of uh, child development and we use the recommended practices to do that. We have also monthly learning series with early childhood professionals via Zoom with topics of interest such as language development, social communication and evaluations. We always include one or two slides about the DEC recommended practices. Families can also sign for an intensive training called First Steps, which includes four sessions that cover birth to three procedures, evaluations, transition rights, and advocacy skills. We have created the curriculum and we have kept in mind the recommended practices as well. In tier two is our sustained supports. About 65% of our families fall in this category. We offer phone consultation with one of our family connection staff for topics related to transition, disability specific resources, and others. Our consultants are all parents of children who have received birth to three services. They're knowledgeable about their procedures and they know where to find the recommended practices and how to use them as they support families. Finally, our tier three, parent to parent support. We have a list of mentors that we can assign to parents who choose to connect with another experienced parent. Connections can last up to four weeks. Parent mentors receive an initial training on how to support a family, which includes a detailed overview of the recommended practices. And uh, I hope that you find this information helpful. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mai Hall and I am with the Parents Place of Maryland. What we did um, as the RP ambassador to the state of Maryland, we created a parent training program. This is, was our third year implementing our parent training workshop throughout the state of Maryland. And this year it was virtual. So that presented with a, a lot of different challenges on how we were to present our DEC recommended practices. So I'll tell you a little bit about the program and how we implemented the recommended practices into this parent training series. It's called Baby Leaders Beginning the Journey. It's for parents of children with disabilities who are ages zero to five who have either been in or are currently in early intervention services. We had five two-hour sessions on Saturdays, and we also had networking and follow-up activities. The networking was mostly for allowing our parents to interact with each other, to get to know each other better, because during virtual, it's really hard to you know, make a conversation when we did it in person, when we had our breakfast and our lunches, parents would talk, would interact, would make friends, would find commonalities with each other. 
And so we really tried to focus on having parents getting to know one another so they could be more willing to share and be more willing to access the information. We focused on topics such as the IFSP process, the IEP transition was a very important topic. We talked a little bit about special education law, dispute resolution, and really how to communicate with teams. Now, communication was very interesting because we had asked how many of our parents have heard of the recommended practices. And since nobody did, we wanted to give them this information so that they can then take it back to their providers and then say, hey, I learned about this really good, cool family practice guide. Can we talk about it more and see how to do it with my child? So this offered parents to be the experts on their children. Next slide. A little bit about how we incorporated, incorporated the family practice guides. We chose to honor the expertise that parents bring by asking parents, what do they already do? Well, how are they playing peekaboo with their child? How are they doing those everyday child learning opportunities such as this parent family practice guide? We were acknowledging the parents' strengths and empowering them to be their child's first teacher. We described how these recommended practices are in fact extensions of what they are actually doing at home and in their communities already. So when I went over a couple of from the family, from transition family practice guides, um, and then a little bit from the environment topic, a lot of parents were like, hey, I do this with my two-year-old. And I'm like, yes, I know. Here's some extra vocabulary on how to take that extension of learning further. And they were just in awe that they, would, they were seeing this written, published PDFs and videos of stuff they were already doing at home. So it made them feel really good to, to know that they were doing something quote unquote right. That's one parent said to me. She's like, I'm doing something right. I'm like, yes, everyone does something right. So the RPs are also a way to define parent-led activities to give them meaning. This also allows for further conversation about parent-child learning opportunities. So we use a chat box and ask parents, what is one way you play with your child to get the conversation started? Next slide. A little bit more about how we use the RPs in training. So once the introduction was done, we asked each parent to choose a family practice guide as a homework activity. We were, they were instructed to read through the different guides, pick one that resonated with them as a homework. So I assigned each parent a topic and they chose which guide within that topic because a lot of topics have three to five guides within them. It was okay if the guides themselves were repeated during their share out it was more important that the parents felt comfortable with a tool of their choosing, but they needed to start somewhere, which is why I chose the topic for them based on the age of their child. For example, a transition age child, their parent got the transition topic, while the infant parents got a family or an environment topic. This whole group share out was only made possible by the virtual nature of the sharing, the training. Their children were in the background already, so some of the parents got creative and were holding up their infant or moved their camera to show um, their little baby lying in the bouncer and then playing peekaboo. And they were actually using terms from the family practice guides. So it was great to see these guides in motion. A lot of these parents, you know, they could actually be part of the videos in the guides themselves. Um, a lot of them had fun. They reflected on the guides as part of their homework. So they had to think about after seeing everything done, come back on the next week and share with the whole group what that meant for them. We also did some data collection and turns out pre-data and post-data revealed that 100% of our parents, parents, gain knowledge in learning how to use the DEC recommended practices, 100%. That was fantastic. So that means every single one of our parents found this information useful. And I think it goes a long way into 
seeing how this tool can be used in a lengthy parent training information series. And that's all I had for my section. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Mitra Saret. I'm the Executive Director of Parent Information Center of Delaware. And wanted to share how we incorporated the recommended practices on our website and including in our social media and newsletters and how we were able to align all of this work in our existing activities. Um, it's also important to note that we, over, we provide oversight of the PTI and F to F programs. And so we're really trying to, it was important for us to find a way to streamline all of these wonderful activities um, and within the existing um, objectives and initiatives of our work. So some of the ways that we've done this is participating by participating on stakeholder groups that represent um, children, infants, and toddlers and their families, which is, are inclusive of the State Systemic Improvement Plan, or ESSIP, and um, partnerships with our Part C and Part B systems. This is particularly um, helpful as we um, provide resources and supports to families of children who are transitioning from Part C to Part B. I'm also an ARPI ambassador as well, and have been an ARPI ambassador for, um, for over a year. And so, as I mentioned, what's, what was really important is just how do we incorporate all of this, this wonderful work in our existing programs. And so this diagram really looks at the areas that we're already covering within our PTI and F to F program, System ad systems advocacy, technical assistance to families and professionals and social, social media and outreach and how we incorporated early intervention practices and the DEC recommended practices um, into all of our existing work. And so when we're talking about social media and outreach, it's really important to um, identify strategies and ways that you're going to um, engage with your families and your, your audience. And so some things that we did we incorporated early intervention topics or the DEC recommended practices into our existing social media schedules. We also um, use this as an opportunity to share um, any uh, state systemic improvement plans or Part C initiatives coming out of our early intervention department on our organization's page. We embedded video clips from the practice guides. So it's really great that we already have the tools that are available um, through the recommended practices that make it very easy to upload to your existing social media platforms. We also use a um, text messaging as to provide a tip of the day to parents and families based on the recommended practices. And it's important to note that in addition to the wonderful information that you are receiving today, many of your peers um, who are also um, RPN, um, maybe RP ambassadors within the parent centers may have really cool or great ideas um, to um, ways that you can engage with your families. And this actually was not our idea. This was an idea that we received from another center. So I always like to highlight that because this is also, this is what's really great about the networking um, and sharing this information because you may get ideas that you may not have thought of before. We also developed a newsletter um, specific to early intervention. And um, in that newsletter, we highlight one recommended practice a, a month. Um, and that's been really um, beneficial to families as well. And so when, as it relates to social media, one thing that you wanna um, think about a few tips is um, identifying or creating an image that is very simplistic, that will grab attention of your audience. And so here, this example here, we were able to utilize, um, we have a child, and then we inc incorporated one of the deck recommended practices there. So it's very simple, but it grabs your reader's attention. When posting to social me media, you want to, again, use a picture to engage and keep the text to a minimum. Also consider posting information at the same time daily. Um, that also helps to increase engagement amongst your audiences. Learn about or find someone within your center that understands social media analytics, because this will be, will be very crucial in helping to identify what's the best time of the day to engage with your audience, when are they looking at your, um, your post, and then you can make changes as necessary. And then consider using the family practice guides as a training for a Facebook Live or other event. So for example, we incorporated um, language learning as part of our Facebook Live series. And we just went through um, the each recommended practice in the, the vignettes 
and we were able to utilize that content and kind of um, and as a Facebook Live. And it was really helpful in a, a very useful way to get that information to families in a condensed format. And so these are just examples of our early intervention newsletter, which goes out to families. And um, I mentioned earlier, we incorporate the deck recommended practice into each um, a practice into each newsletter. This was actually um, one way to talk about the recommended practices and introduce this to families. So I just wanted to show this as an example. And then um, lastly, just wanted to briefly talk about early intervention and systems advocacy. So I mentioned earlier that our staff participate on stakeholder groups, um, including the ESIP and the, um, the ICC. So it's really important when we're talking about integrating all of this work into our existing platforms. Um, as PTIs and F2F, -F, many of us, many of our staff serve on stakeholder groups representing the needs of children and families. And so this is an opportunity to incorporate the DEC recommended practices into um, and to promote awareness within our existing systems and apply a lot of the, the work, uh, apply this to our existing work. So for example, I, we participate in our ESSIP and on our leadership and um, professional development subcommittees. And so part of that work was developing professional development training for our early intervention staff, which was inclusive of the DEC recommended practices. And so this was an opportunity for me as an RP ambassador to introduce that and incorporate that in our work. Also at our um, ICC meetings, which are held quarterly, we are now on the agenda and we provide a, a brief overview of the DEC recommended practices at every meeting. So it reinforces the recommended practices for those who may not be, um, who may not be familiar with the terminology or hearing about the recommended practices or utilizing it on a consistent basis. We also use this as an opportunity, sorry, we also use this as an opportunity to disseminate resources um, in the learning decks as well. And so that's just a brief, um, th those are some examples of how we incorporate it from a systemic level and um, how we incorporate it deck recommended practices into our existing projects. Thank you. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Deepa Srinivasa Varadhan and I'm the RP ambassador to New Jersey. I work at SPAN Parent Advocacy Network, uh, which is also the uh, PTI and F2F. Um, in, and we are also the parent-to-parent -parent, um, um, affiliate for New Jersey. Um, in addition to being the RP ambassador, I'm also the CDC's Learn the Science Act Early Ambassador and uh, the State Parent Lead for uh, our early childhood initiatives, um, such as home visiting and early childhood comprehensive systems coin uh, work. So um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, how I've been able to share the information about the RPs with, uh, within my parent center and uh, supporting my colleagues to share it with um, families and professionals that they work with, as well as um, with other partners across the state. So in terms of uh, introducing the RPs to your colleagues at your parent center, um, I think it's you know the once once you become the RP ambassador or you're in, or you're aware of the recommended practices and you ta start talking to them about it, there all there's always some curiosity about what is DEC, what are what are the RPs. So um, just engaging in those initial conversations and then sharing some of the informational videos to introduce the um, uh, the information um, to the to your colleagues is really helpful, and then. Um, schedule a separate um, time to review the practice guides in detail um, so they uh, are able to get an understanding of um, how the practices can be helpful um, for both uh, families and professionals. And then there's something called the RP pop quiz that was introduced to you as part of the part one of this um, recording. Um, and the, the RP pop quiz is really a fun way to uh, help your colleagues get a better understanding of the practices. Um, and once they are comfortable and um, uh, about with the information that you have shared, you can also support 
um, them with their presentation to other professionals, maybe that they, uh, um, they are working with or other programs that they're working with. Um, so here I'm trying to um, share an example of a child care center. So and if your colleague is trying to work with a child care center to, um, uh, to maybe help them become more inclusive um, and support children with special health care needs in their child care center, then um, that would be an ideal opportunity to um, help your colleague introduce the deck recommended practices to um, that child care center. So um, they can um, help the child care center staff to understand um, how the practice guides could be helpful, uh, maybe to identify a child's strength um, and support the child's learning by adapting the environment and the activities um, and empowering parents to make those informed decisions. So by sharing um, the family practice guides with families um, uh, and which is available both in English and Spanish, the child care center staff can uh, empower parents um, and then all, and then, app, and then, in addition to doing introducing the practice guides, again using the RP pop quiz um, and what is called the performance um, checklist um, with the child care center staff, the your colleagues and you can help um, the understanding um, of the child care center staff and then um, also help them um, use some self-evaluation and self-reflection to um, see if they are already using some of these practices um, or how they could better use some of these practices in their everyday work. Um, and I'm going to also share another example of a meeting maybe in, in your state which brings together um, stakeholders from across the state um, including parents of children with and without special health care needs. Um, and maybe the, your goal is to help um, parents um, be, um, pa parents to participate at all levels and be part of all the uh, decision making that happens at all levels. So, um, you, you know, in addition to supporting parents, you could also introduce the recommended practices at the meeting um, to all the attendees. You can share a flyer and the informational video. And what would what might be really helpful is the family and teaming and collaboration practice guides. Um, that, and that would help both the families and the professionals um, to become better partners um, and ensure that family-centered practices are followed um, and to enable families to be those equal partners uh, from needs assessment to planning to implementing activities. Um, and, and then the performance checklist um, that we talked about um, in the previous slide as well, um, definitely would be helpful for the prof professionals to understand how they can be um, better collaborators um, and how they can be better leaders. The, the performance checklist definitely provides some guidance and motivation uh, for how they could uh, be, be using uh, the practice guides effectively and implementing um, the DEC recommended practices. Uh, and obviously, you know, you can um, network with the stakeholders at the meeting. If you already have some existing relationships, um, you can look at how you can strengthen them and then you can follow up and um, use the recommended practices to align with um, some of the goals and activities of your partners. Um, and uh, that would help them the, integrate the recommended practices into their everyday work as well. So um, in addition, um, RPs can be used for advocacy and leadership. And you know, my um, uh, colleagues, um, shared throughout this uh, presentation about how they have been doing some of these advocacy and leadership activities um, within their centers. Um, Midra already talked about um, the, their work um, with their state interagency coordinating councils and SICC subcommittees. Um, so um, definitely, um, you know, I would say think about all the different 
partners and programs that you're working with. Um, maybe you're working with your Title V program um, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, as I mentioned, I work with our early childhood initiatives, home visiting um, and early childhood comprehensive systems um, COIN teams. So I um, often talk to them about the DEC recommended practices at, at, at the meetings that I am with them. Uh, I'm always talking about family engagement. Um, so it, the DEC recommended practices is a wonderful resource that I'm able to share. Um, I work closely with our Title V program as well and um, support them with the, um, with the family engagement piece around in, in, in terms of the uh, maternal, maternal child health block grant um, activities. So again, that's another great opportunity for me to um, share the recommended practices. Um, I uh, network wherever possible. Um, and then we advocate for policies and resources that promote the use of the rec DEC recommended practices. Often uh, partners and programs are looking for evidence-based practices and information that they can um, incorporate or integrate into the work that they're doing. So the DEC recommended practices are definitely um, helpful in that regard. Um, and uh, it, can, uh, it can become that trusted resource that the, your partners and programs can refer to. Um, and then um, identify and support parents who may be interested in advocating for systems change. This is a very important piece um, because in addition to um, supporting professionals to work with families, we need to empower our parents. We need to um, not only give them the tools that would be helpful for them in their um, um, everyday routine or uh, interactions with their child, own child, but also um, uh, introduce them to um, more leadership and advocacy opportunities. And um, the DEC recommended practices uh, is particularly the family and leadership uh, recommended practices are really helpful for parents to um, review and understand what they can um, expect of the professionals that they are working with and how they could be those better partners and encourage those professionals to share the information in a way that's meaningful for them. Um, and that would eventually empower them to advocate for um, systems change. So I work with a lot of parent leaders um, and um, I, that helped me to reach families within diverse communities to promote um, developmental health for young children. Um, so that is my role as the CDC's Act Early Ambassador, but I also support these parent leaders to understand the DEC recommended practices as, a, as an important tool that they can share with other families to support um, uh, not only just um, the interactions um, that they can uh, enable for their children in the different environments that they are with their with their children but also to empower those parents in their communities um, to think about how they can partner with their child's school or with their child's pediatrician um, so in that regard preparing them for that for that leadership role um, the DEC recommended practices are definitely helpful in that um, in that regard. Um, and then definitely establish partnerships across levels. As I mentioned, think about all your different counterparts, whether they are state, local, or national, and um, talk about the DEC recommended practices as often as you can, and look for those opportunities to coordinate with them, uh, to align your goals with them, to align some activities with them. And then um, that would eventually uh, help us build that inclusive system of um, services and supports for all families. Thank you. So thank you um, to my colleagues for sharing those great examples. I get excited every time I hear those and think of great ideas and things that I want to implement um, locally where I work here in Georgia. Um, so but if we haven't gotten you excited enough, or if you're still trying to wrap your head around what do you do with this and how do you do this, um, I just want to point this out to you. Um, on the later slide, I'll give you a link to this video. Um, I would encourage you to take a look at this video. It's a great little three-minute video that, in, uh, 
that we believe is a really good way to introduce the recommended practices to families. It just kind of breaks it down. It makes it really simple and it takes it, as you can see there in a, in a home with a, a mother and a daughter, um, really just, just makes it um, practical and useful. And I think it would be a nice compliment to the, the information that we've shared with you today. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Um, in addition, and that link is at the bottom of this slide, this resourceful slide, that shared knowledge video. But in addition, everything that you've heard us talk about today, rec make reference to the recommended practices, the practice improvement tools, the checklists, um, the practice guides for families in both English and Spanish. You've got all those links right here. This, these links and all of this information is also in a handout that's gonna be posted alongside this um, recording and the PowerPoint slides. And the second bullet on this list is your DEC RP ambassadors. So the ladies that you heard from today, my colleagues, are RP ambassadors, but there's additional RP ambassadors across the country that work in parent centers. And I encourage you to reach out to them if you have questions. But the last thing I wanna say is these, these tools and these resources and the recommended practices are not just for RP ambassadors. Anyone working in a parent center who thinks this um, could help and enhance the work that you do with families of young children, um, please explore these resources. Please take a look and consider some of the things that you heard today because we really, um, we all do better when we spread this, this valuable information to families across the country. And with that, um, on behalf of myself and my colleagues, we want to thank you for joining us today and encourage you to check out part one if you haven't seen it already and share this information with those that you work with in your own parent center again so we can continue to spread this information.